Sunday Papers on Off The Ball. You're welcome back. Joe Malloy with you this afternoon. I'll just update you on the GA. We're coming up on 20 minutes gone now in the 145 throw-in. So namely in Division 2 North, we have Mayo against Mead at Elvery's McHale Park. It's Mayo who lead by two points. Mayo seven points. Mead 1-2 is the latest there. Down four points. Westmead no score in the other game in Division 2 uh, north and in Division 2 South Clare are a goal and four points Cork are five points so a two point lead for Clare again about 20 minutes gone in that game and in Leash it's Leash a point Kildare four points also 20 minutes gone in that game I'll turn to the headlines in the Sunday papers starting with the Sunday Times and it's the uh, moment when Kai Havertz went in on goal uh, against Chelsea or for Chelsea excuse me last night against Manchester City so he took it around the keeper and uh, the headline is Porto Prince and it's Kai Havertz here and it's Man City nil Chelsea 1 then I have the Sunday World and it's Super Blues have it and it's Kai in the sky as Chelsea crowned kings of Europe Kai Havertz lost for words says Kevin Palmer beneath that Roy back in uh, Celtic sites apparently the Eddie Howe to Celtic move fell down. It seems Roy Keane back in Celtic mines. Then we have the star to have and to hold. Lots of Kai Havertz puns, as you can imagine. To have and to hold. Uh, Tuchel bests Pep again. That's uh, the view of the uh, star. Chelsea crown Kings of Europe. Sunday Independent have the Kings of Europe headline, and it's a picture of Kai Havertz lifting the trophy afterwards to in front of the Chelsea fans. Chelsea Joy as Havertz strike completes a remarkable turnaround under Tuchel. I mean, it's been a very impressive 124 days work, you have to say that. Then uh, the Sunday Mirror and it's Havertz on his knees after scoring the goal. Kai and Mighty, Havertz ends Pep's Euro dream. Picture of Pep there mid-game with his hands on his cheeks, not liking what he's seeing. We have uh, Sun Sport and again, it's Havertz, Kai Havertz. Kai's first half strike, hands Tuchel glory. And then a theme inside, we might get to it in a few moments' time, but it's on the back page here of The Sun. Pep tinkers yet again and pays the price. Obviously, no Fernandinho, no uh, Rodri in that more defensive midfield position last night. And then uh, the Mail on Sunday, Kai and Mighty, picture of Havertz after scoring the goal. Havertz goal fires Chelsea to glory in Porto as Pep's men fluff their lines. And beneath that, Philip Quinn, Ireland in line to host 16 World Cup matches apparently. So uh, staging the 2030 World Cup is not the gimmick we're all thinking. So it seems it's a very realistic possibility, said Roy Barrett speaking to the Sunday papers. The focus is getting UEFA support and the bid looks the strongest. So if Ireland and the UK win the UEFA bid, then they're up against uh, South American bid in particular. It seems Uruguay and a couple of other countries. So it seems 16 matches would be coming to Ireland if they were to win the 2030 bid. That's on the back page of the Mail on Sunday. And this story as well, I mean, we'll probably come to this. There are a few pieces on the Olympics and the lack of support for the Olympics, not least around Tokyo. But IOC, that's the International Olympic Committee. This is on the back page. It's by Nick Harris. They're seeking to be absolved, quote, even in the case of death. So they're getting all the athletes who are going to pitch up on July 23rd for the Olympics, and I would presume it'll be the same for the Paralympics, that they have to agree that they're participating at their own risk and their own responsibility, including any impact on my participation to and or performance in the game, serious bodily injury or even or even death raised by the potential exposure to health hazards. And then they add in such as COVID-19. So it's a hell of a waiver to sign. It's basically um, completely releasing the IOC of any liability for any loss, injury, infectious disease or uh, damage. Now, there are waivers at time signed, but never before, says uh, Nick Harris, has there been one which specifically mentioned death. So it's a strange one, isn't it? Now, very up to say we have uh, Tommy Conlon of the Sunday Independent with us. Hi, Tommy. Hi, Joel. And Mick O'Keefe, CEO of Teneo Ireland, obviously former Dublin footballer, League of Ireland player as well. Hi, great to have you, Mick. And Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you. Tommy, I saw the Keith Earls book is coming out. You're, you worked with Keith Earls on that. So I'd say that was an interesting project. Always struck me as a very interesting fella. Arrived very young on the scene, not least that Lions tour in 09. And I think, judging from afar, and this will be the interesting thing in the book, took a few years maybe to find his feet and his comfort levels in professionalism. 
Yeah, uh, I hope it'll be interesting, Joe. I think it will. Uh, just to say, it's not quite past tense yet in terms of the writing. I'm actually right in the middle of it as we uh, at the moment, uh, kind of uh, in my bunker, um, ten hours a day, every day, uh, racking up the words and uh, trying to get the chapters done. You know, so it's just. Uh, Everyone or anyone who's done a book will be familiar with that uh, stage of the process where basically you just lock the door and throw away the key mm. and just keep churning out the words every day. Okay. All the interview, all the interviews are done, all the research is done. Um, and to uh, answer your other point, I, I, um, you, you will be familiar a lot of elite sportsmen, athletes over the years and women will have said, at least occasionally, you don't know me. All you see is, you know, the one percent of me. The, that's on. That's the one percent that's uh, playing on a Saturday or Sunday or whatever. And uh, people, uh, everyone, I guess myself included, conflate uh, the person we see on the pitch with the uh, actual person. And uh, I think it, I think readers will find in the case of Keith Earls, as in many many more of these athletes, that there is an enormous amount that we don't know mm. and uh, and we presume i guess we presume too often that we do know and uh i keat is is has been open to sharing a lot a lot from his his story and uh, i think i think readers probably will be surprised uh uh to discover some of those stories and some of the reality of being an elite sports person very good. Well, best of luck with it. Thanks, Joe. So uh, one other uh, story on the front page is actually I meant to mention. It's on the front page of the uh, Sunday Times and the Mail on Sunday, just on Robbie Keane's contract situation mix. So Keane nears resolution to stand off with FAI. I think people are pretty familiar with this story at this stage. Robbie Keane signed a four-year deal with the FAI in 2018 to bring him up to 2022. In April 2020, so halfway through, I guess, he was informed that Stephen Kenny wouldn't be taking him on board or didn't need his services. And in effect, he hasn't really had anything to do, but was still very much under contract. So this is Paul Rowan here in the Sunday Times. FAI Chief Executive Jonathan Hill is said to be making substantial progress in resolving their standoff with Robbie Keane after he was dropped last year by Stephen Kenny. So Roy Barrett, the FAI chairman, there's ongoing dialogue with Robbie and Jonathan and we'll see what comes of that. We should have an outcome in the not too distant future. And on the Mail on Sunday, they just say, meanwhile, Robbie Keane's contract situation at the FAI should be resolved soon, according to uh, Barrett. There's ongoing dialogue, the same quotes there. I mean, I guess make this things resolved soon one way or the other. I mean, the thing's nearly up at this stage. We're nearly into 2022. Yeah, and look, what, it's one of John Delaney's parting gifts for the looks of things. And, mm. you know, <clears throat> what I was surprised at, and I didn't realise this was the number, I thought it was a little bit less, was the 250,000 um, per annum. Like, when you think about the finances of the FAI and you think about the prize money in the league and everything like that, it's just an astonishing waste for someone who's not doing any work, you know. So I think there has been chatter around trying to give him another job. Um, they spoke about this 100-year anniversary in some kind of ambassadorial role. Um, it does seem that this has gone personal, which is, you see, he seems to have been quite hurt by the way he was treated. So it's more a point of principle than anything else. So he might just sit it out. Mm. It says here in the Sunday Times, it was thought Keane, as you mentioned, Mick, might fulfil an ambassadorial role in the forthcoming celebrations, though sources close to Keane dismissed that situation or that suggestion. Uh, last night. This was agreed with John Delaney, this contract, in 2018, even though Mick McCarthy had only signed a two-year contract. His salary around 250000 a year. That is the original sin here, isn't it, Tommy, that yeah. John Delaney and the FAI, in their wisdom, a parting gift, as Mick O'Keefe says there, gave Mick McCarthy a two-year contract and decided it would be a good idea to give Robbie Keane a four-year contract. So it just created a mess here. And obviously, I mean, when Robbie Keane's dropped the way he was dropped, he's going to feel hurt by the whole thing. And, and I suspect Mick is right when he says things got personal. I, I suspect so too. And it is one of the legacy uh, issues left over from the Delaney regime, as you see. R Robbie Keane is perfectly entitled to the money. The contract is legit. And um, he's not doing anything wrong in that sense. But it is very, very embarrassing for him. 
he has been essentially uh, on gardening leave for 12 months through no fault of his own but um, Stephen Kenny didn't want him uh, ar ar uh, involved in his uh, uh, backroom staff as we know mm. and so um, uh, Robbie's had 12 months doing nothing and picking up the, picking up taking a quarter of a million from an organization that is essentially insolvent that has something like 70 million in debt and I think Robbie Keane should have walked away with uh, last year uh, sorted out something even from his own sense of pride or honor uh, if I'm not wanted I'll leave us know if you're not wanted somewhere you leave you walk away and um, maybe if maybe ha hammered out some sort of a, an agreement but he could he could afford you one would imagine the financial loss and the FAI cannot afford to be paying quarter of a million to someone who isn't uh, through no fault of his own but still is not doing any work for it yeah it's crazy I think Tommy though it comes down to it, 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 it comes back to how public the humiliation was so he's more or less told he wasn't his face didn't fit and he wasn't fit for purpose um, yeah. and I think he took that quite personally and it was dragged out in, in very public glare of the media you know and I think he's probably just sitting there going well look this is my revenge you know he doesn't need the money you know he do doesn't want to be mm -hmm. redeployed on a better way of saying it so you know um, I think he was quite hurt at how the news was relayed to himself as well which seemed to have been post leak over yeah, a phone call yeah. so you know in saying that if Jonathan Hill has gone in there who has an enormous job in his hands who's doing his best who doesn't need this hassle either so you'd like to think that he could come to his senses and do something for the for the greater good Mm. And it's, it's, it's like to give the money back and ring fence it for the development of women's football or the league or yeah. something. You could do something to 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 come out well out of this. And do, doing something for for pig iron for for out of uh, grieve a sense of grievance isn't. Uh, uh, I think we'd mostly agree isn't a great idea either. And uh, I take your point, Mick, that he was hurt by it. But uh, in in professional football, as as we all know. There, uh, people are routinely fired and got rid of and hurt. I mean, it's 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 everyday realities of fellas being uh, uh, not getting contracts renewed, getting players not getting contracts renewed. It, it's it's as we know, everyone is a disposable in that in that industry, and one would have thought, therefore, that Robbie would have been a bit more thick-skinned about the realities of of a sport yeah, he's been in for twenty years. Does. Yeah, the only difference, Tommy, though, is, is you know, look, and this is a fellow with, what, over 100 caps for Ireland, record goals yeah. for, he hadn't done anything wrong. Like, he hadn't done anything, Agreed. you know, was, was the point. So, yeah. he wasn't, it, the difference here is that he, he wasn't, this wasn't a performance-based issue, or this was no. just something that was poorly handled. Stephen Kenny was fully entitled to say, I didn't want him on my team, but surely they could have done something in the background. This is like, you know, uh, uh, it was humiliating for, let's be honest, and he's not a guy that always gets the plaudits that he should have got, one of our greatest players of all time. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. He, he gets to read about him being stepped down uh, from a position without having any chance mm. to prove himself. They should have done something. They should have handled it so much better than how they handled it. Agreed. In saying agreed. that now, he's the chance to get the upper, to, to get the, the moral high ground and actually sort it out if he wants to. Because no one, no one wants to see the FAI down 250 grand a year when the money could be going somewhere else. Mm. Well, his agent refused to comment for the piece. As to what Keane's motivations are, we don't really know, or what his thinking is, we don't really know, to be fair to him. He may come out in due course and explain his side of the story. But this just came up in uh, Sunday briefing, Sunday papers briefing okay, with the FAI. Yeah. That's how it yeah, came up. Fair. So we'll see what Robbie Keane has to say about the whole situation, I would think, at some stage in the future in, in due course. But it's on the front page there, the Sunday Times and the back page of the Mail on Sunday. It is a lot of money, obviously, 250 grand a year and, and same next year until yeah. the contract is up. Chelsea against Man City. A really mm. good game, I thought, Tommy. Uh, what about the, the pieces in the paper today? What are they making of it? Thoroughly enjoyed it, Joe. I think I, I get the sense that most people were pleasantly surprised at how dramatic it was, packed with action and incident, attacking play. Um, there was the usual uh, residual fear, as there is around these big set-piece occasions, that you could have stagnation through through pure uh, caution and fear and conservatism. And um, but. Uh, um, the match reports, I mean, uh, uh, as, as someone who's uh, done his stint at the front line doing live match reports, I've an abiding respect for every single uh, sports reporter who is on a late night deadline on, of a live football match. It's incredibly stressful. And uh, I have bottomless ad admiration for the people who do as well. And so uh, I, 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 I often, just, just out of more professional sort of, 
curiosity. Uh, one of the things I'll do on a Sunday is just compare and contrast how various reporters handled that stress and managed to uh, deliver, you know, the best the best pieces, the best reports, you know. And once again, and 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 once again, the standard is top notch, like across the papers, or at least the ones uh, I've read, the Times, Sunday Times, um, the Telegraph. Um, the Mail on Sunday, uh, the Independent, the UK Independent, you know, and um, the, these these fellows are churning out these match reports under ridiculous pressure, and even trying to trying to get all your facts in a row is one thing, but trying to write you know stylish prose and uh, 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 or even do a coherent report would be adequate, but some of them are capable of of writing uh, actually very composed pieces as if they had. Um, a couple of days to write it, and um, it's invidious, I suppose. But to mention to name individuals, but in Ireland, I mean, uh, I actually had a bit of a Twitter spat with Rory Smith of the New York Times a couple of years ago. Uh, we uh, he was um, tweeting about the pressures and about the job of doing live deadline match reporting, and. Uh, that the thread followed and various contributors and and um, I, I chipped in maybe a little bit uncollegially of me to say that <laughs> to say that there is no more stressful match reporting situation than a hurling game, yeah. and I've done I've done it a few times. It's horrendous, and uh, <clears throat> because apart <clears throat> in football, for example, you might get a you will get a normally a low scoring game. And you can uh, you can have your head down at your laptop typing out paragraphs because you don't have necessarily much to record of live action. Whereas in hurling, uh, for example, you, I mean you you you're trying to compose your intro, then there's a point score, so you have to record the the point, and then back it back to your laptop again, another, and then you're distracted again, another point, another point, another point, <laughs> and there could be fifty or sixty scores. 10 substitutions, all sorts going on, and get all that done uh, more or less on the final whistle. Mm. Um, so, Tommy, uh, I, I, I thought with, the, with your big budgets there in the end, though, that you'd have an army of statisticians there <laughs> doing that stuff, you know? Um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, if only, Mick, if only. Um, you know what? Someone still, has to, someone still has to write the report, Mick, you know? Uh, you can't have a committee doing that, like. And... Um, uh, uh, but um, so uh, I, 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 it was from that point of view I was looking at it, and as I was saying, the standard is really, really good. Sam Wallace, in particular, in the Telegraph, I thought was excellent, and um, he, he, even even allowing for even uh, allowing for how good he, he was. I mean, there's a couple of mistakes in the copy, um, and that is not at all, and that is not at all any re remotely anything to do with his uh, professionalism or, or a bit it's, it's actually a superb match report it's just that the pure stress of the time he had meant that there was just a couple of things uh, of, of errors that weren't picked up very minor and if you go through across all the the, the page or at least the sports pages i've read the standard of reportage writing coherent with all relevant facts and all relevant incidents there's a, a mixture of analysis in the report had to to do with guardiola's team selection and uh, in report after report these top professionals have managed to capture a lot of the essence of the night yeah so i've uh graeme soonest here for instance as an, anal an, an analysis piece excuse me page three of the sunday times yeah. it's both good and bad like it, it I, I, I turned to Sunas because I wanted to see what did he make of, for the first time in 60 games, Pep going without a Fernandinho or a Rodri. I thought, well, Sunas as a midfielder will be interesting in this. So he doesn't get there at first. He starts off by saying, you know, Manchester City, the best group of players I've seen in British football in my uh, 50 years, talks about how difficult it must be for Pep to pick a team. But then he talks about Tuchel, says it was a modern masterclass tactically great advert for the Premier League Chelsea made more of less possession they looked more threatening than City did talked about the distances between their centre half and the centre forward could have only been 25 yards it was extremely compact hard to break down Chelsea brought City onto them and then sprung from there that was exactly how, how Kai Havertz scored his goal just before half time 
uh, talked about how brilliant Mason Mount is. He really loves Mount and said N'Golo Kante was my man of the match. He was everywhere, putting out fires against City's midfield. On the flanks, Ben Chilwell had Riyad Mahrez in his pocket. Rhys James did the same with Raheem Sterling on the other side of the pitch. I thought that was all really interesting, good stuff. You could see City getting frustrated as the match wore on. He says as well then of the Rodri Fernandinho omissions. He just said, City think they can outgun anyone in any game and that explains why Guardiola started with neither Fernandinho nor Rodri, his two holding midfielders, and then sent on Fernandinho for De Bruyne when he was chasing the game. And then he just moves on to Phil Foden. Phil Foden played in midfield. He's going to be a great player. He's going to do well at the Euros, etc. And I kind of think, well, Graeme, like, tell me what you think here. Is this the reason they lost the game? Was this a ridiculous mistake? I mean, I know why he picked them. Uh, what do you yeah. think of it? So I was kind of touch disappointed with Sunis there. I wanted to know, did he think Pep had screwed this up or it was just very understandable and wasn't the winning or losing of the game? Like, for instance, you turn the page over and it's Henry Winter and his yeah. line is very much Guardiola's gamble fails on biggest stage of all. Even the most confident and sure of foot can stumble. Even such refined minds as Guardiola can cloud over. Why hadn't he started Fernandinho? He's 36, still a vital force. It looked almost arrogance by Guardiola, says Henry Winter, omitting his chief dog of war, relying on creative types in the engine room, appeared a mistake at kickoff and looked calamitous as Thomas Tuchel's better organised Chelsea took control. Tuchel kept it simple, playing players in the right positions. N'Golo Kante ran the show, etc. I'd love to know, does Sunis feel that strongly about it, but you don't quite know based on today. Mick, what did you, what did you take from it all? Yeah. I, I, I was really interested in this and kind of not, not quite to Tommy's uh, forensic kind of examination of the reports, but I had a look at the analysis, um, particularly in the UK press, the BBC and the Guardian and other places, and they're all ish saying the same thing, which is interesting post-match around, you know, it, it seems to be quite black and white. This kind of, you know, analysis favours the victorious a little bit here. Mm. So it's all about two cool tactical masterclass you know, tactical battle, you know, I, I think soon as for me, it, it kind of half reads like he rang this in, like it, it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't actually, he doesn't go into deep detail on the why he keeps it at kind of very high level. I think, um, you know, he touches on a few of the themes that we spoke about Kante, you know, how, you know, he, nice thing about, you know, the, how compact they were and how difficult it is to actually do that. And it was a masterclass in terms of being able to blunt the opposition. And when you have someone like Kante, who's a defensive holding midfielder getting man of the match, well, then that kind of shows you. I do, I did like the Henry Winter piece more um, on page five of the Sunday Times um, because he kind of goes, you know, all guns blazing here on, on, on Guardiola um, to a point where he more than strongly hints that Guardiola's, you know, he overthought it, uh, was trying to be too clever, and there was a kind of a, 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 sm a kind of a smidgen of arrogance about how he set the team up. It was kind of like, you know, you guys are going to set up defensively. We're going to come out with a load of creative players in the team. We're going to pass around you, and we're going to beat you. Um, whereas actually, in hindsight, what is proven is that he really should have started with a better balanced side. And then by the time he actually got his team right, it was too late. Mm -hmm. Is the is the team I'm reading in that in 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 that piece now? He did another, and I think it is in this article as well. Um, that you know that his, the way he set himself up, Tuchel, that is, was a victory for simplicity and discipline. And actually, that's a theme that runs through some of the the GA pieces that come as well. And that really, the Guardiola thing was just about overthinking uh, and over, over been trying to be too clever. Mm. Um, and actually, it's it's quite it's quite stinging. I actually think that that Henry Winter piece on 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 page five of of the Sunday Times. Um, and and he goes into fairly kind of fairly uh, uh, not aggressive is the wrong word, but it's fairly sharp yeah. In, in, yeah. in in places, you know. Well, it's now Tommy placed alongside the Leon quarterfinal last year on Pep's part. His neuroticism yeah. almost getting the better of him. His genius, his overthinking. Tuchel got into his head with the FA Cup defeat, mm. and he panicked. He didn't hold his nerve. Is the way this has been portrayed. I mean. I, I get that, and Fernandinho, I'm sure, may have uh, been 10 yards further along than Gundogan was and maybe would have intercepted that ball. Who knows? I, I guess th mm. the point it overlooks, though, where I worry it gets a bit too simplistic, is that it overlooks the fact City still didn't actually score. You know, I mean, OK, anyone can concede a goal, that happens, but City didn't score a goal in this game. I'm not sure if Fernandinho, even though he played a lovely through ball at one stage, is he the creative force they were missing? So uh, there is that aspect to yeah. this as well. I, I, You'd wonder, you see, sometimes, um, 
you'd wonder did Guardiola's selection when he announced that to his team mm. now uh, I'd like you'd like to know when was it at fr- Friday training uh, when when does he normally sit down the team in the dressing room and l- name name it because that's the time when you'll ever get a more silent dressing room in any sport mm. than when the manager is naming the team mm. and I wonder did this um, um, d- decision out of left field, did it spook the horses? Did it frighten the horses a bit? Beyond the issue, Joe, uh, I take your point about Fernandinho, they still didn't score a goal, so maybe it didn't matter that much. But I wonder, psychologically, did it frighten the horses a little bit? Yeah. They're very they're very highly strung, these thoroughbreds. And you just wonder, did it just cloud their... Uh, cloud their minds that it saw a seed of unease mm, and mm. did that ripple through the team and there was apparent confusion even in the uh, if you're to take out the psychological or emo- emotional aspect of it uh, if you're to looking at them at the, the, the normal systemic pass systematic pass and move that they usually it was just a bit uh, it was a bit cl- clouded mm. it just wasn't quite functioning at the normal rhythm and um uh, and the, the contrast then with Tuchel's team, what I thought was 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 he sent out a team absolutely brilliantly prepared psychologically, emotionally, and uh, sometimes that is just done by an appeal to the emotions of the team. But sometimes it's also because they love the formation he has picked, mm. they love the idea, and that makes them feel secure in themselves. And we could, we could all see it for last night. He had a he had a very condensed configuration between uh, his defence midfield and his forward line about 25 metres between them and he managed they managed to condense uh, the Man City the, uh, otherwise deadly Man City uh, pass and move game into that sort of rectangle and the Chelsea players seemed to absolutely know, know believe in it and know exactly what each person was doing mm. and performed accordingly yeah agree with that total clarity and I think yeah. as well, Mick, everybody now is Kante in their World Eleven at the moment. <laughs> it makes you think about France as well, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, but yeah, look, I, I, I do think though with these things, look, Guardiola is a brilliant manager and, mm. you know, he always tries to set his teams up to play. Um, and he, and I know soon as alluded to the analogy of, of having too many dresses to wear and maybe you pick the wrong costume because he has a, a whole embarrassment of riches in his, in his squad. Um, but is, 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 isn't it so striking though when of 60 games this year he's either had a Rodri yeah. or a Fernandinho in 59 of them Yeah. and this, this is the first time this starting 11 had ever played together like I thought Mick, he, I, he, I thought Foden looked a bit lost in that deeper three mm. Foden looked lost he started Sterling who hasn't really been um, his face hasn't fitted um, this year either but I do think though in these games circumstance can can lead to way a game plays out obviously so like if Chelsea scored first the way they set themselves up, it was always going to be really difficult to break them down. Yes, right? Yeah. Um, and and I think we can be very clever after the fact. Yeah. Um, look, of course, you look at it now and you say, should you have set up differently? Why wouldn't you have played Fernandino or Rodri? Mm. And you kind of go, yeah, he should have, right? But that's been wise now. Mm. So he's thinking they're ahead in a match on Thursday or Friday or wherever the time is. He's thinking about how he's going to play around them. He's putting trust in his flair players. He's starting Sterling, Foden, De Bruyne. You know, like it's there's there's not probably a, a more potent ball playing force in the moment you know, like like those fellas. So, you know, I can understand the logic of what he did in mm. hindsight. Look, obviously he's got it wrong. You yeah, know? yeah. Um, no, uh, totally agree with that. Totally agree with the hindsight. And in advance, I mean, it was very possible to say, well, look at the bravery of this selection. Wow, he's going to imbue his whole team with such confidence, etc. We are definitely uh, um, Sunday Joe, morning sorry. quarterbacking. Sorry, Tommy. Last one. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry to cut across to Joe, but there was a lot of, there, there, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of observers and pundits were flagging it up from the. No, moment it's that, that that's true. Brian Kerr and Niall Quinn were raising yeah. raising more than an eyebrow and version anyway. There, there was a lot of people. There was a lot of people online and elsewhere yeah. uh, uh, wondering in advance: Has he out out out? out um, and I think Matt Dickinson in the Sunday Times, and one of the guys here, talks about that. There was a sense that maybe he was trying. He knew that Tuchel was coming up with something mm. and that he was trying to outmaneuver the manoeuvre yeah. uh, and, and maybe to, not to second guess Tuchel but almost to third guess him and, uh, and, and 
it's not necessarily um, hindsight. Uh, That's Joe, true there was, as well. a, there was no. a lot of concern, uh, but and I, I thought one line from Tuchel afterwards. He was very telling. He said, "We wanted to put a stone in their shoe. We wanted to put a stone in the Manchester City clockwork. In the Manchester City clockwork, mm. and put a stone in the in the otherwise in the machine. Yeah, and and they did it." They sure did. It but was, I put it, you know, uh, yeah. I, I, I'd much rather be a season ticket holder for Man City than Chelsea. Like, you know, I'd rather go watch Man City, to be honest with you. But, yeah. that's, but the other thing that's interesting in the analysis, sorry, one last point, Joe, yes, um, yeah. is, um, and I found it interesting as well in the post-match interviews, is um, the three English players in the Chelsea team um, played particularly well. And um, I think Chelsea is a club who has had a lot of imported players. But if you look at the great Chelsea teams of... A decade ago where they would have had a spine of, of English players. I think it was interesting to note a 21, 22 and 24 year old um, backbone and essentially the, the Chelsea team. Some of them are homegrown um, and I think it also you know would point to and I know it, it's not for now but you know the amount of young talent um, the English national team has at this moment in time um, and what a cracking chance they have if they get their team right in the summer. Yeah very much so. We're going to pick things up more with uh, Mick and Tommy in just a second, but it's gone half-time in a few of these Allianz Football League games, including in Castle Bar. Tommy Rooney's watched the first half there. Tommy, I have Mayo against Meath here in total control. Mayo 3-11. That is a hell of a scoreline after 35 minutes of football. Mayo 3-11 to Meath 1-5. Well, Joe, yeah, Mayo are hammering Meath here. Uh, I'll be honest, when I when I was driving up the road today to Castle Bar, I was thinking, do you know what? Mayo have made seven changes the Mead uh, team looks pretty settled. Uh, I think we can give them a go here. But Andy McAtee made seven changes before half time. A number of younger lads have gotten a start. And you can really tell that Mayo are a step above them up here today. James Carr scored 2 1, top scorer so far. A fine goal in injury time. Pretty much buried Mead's hope uh, of a comeback. There's a 12 uh, point deficit here at half time. Killian O'Connor scored a penalty straight after the water break. And then Carr's first goal came a couple of moments after that. One of the moments to sum up the half, Joe. Meade are attacking. Lee Keegan was such an easy turnover on the halfway line. Plays a lovely ball to Killian O'Connor. Takes a touch. Finds Jermud. Jermud goes through on goal. Cut a shot. Plays the ball across to James Carr and it's a tap in. Now, the referee did check for a square ball and I'm pretty sure Andy McAtee was shouting for a two. But uh, it wasn't. No luck for Meade. Meade did draw level at one stage in the half. Uh, a brilliant run from Jack O'Connor who scored Meade's first point of the game. Drew a save from Rob Henley and Breen, Breen Condon bundled it in. That left it 1-2 to f- 5 points after about 14 minutes. But after that, Joe Mayo have just taken over completely. Mead have had four different free takers. Uh, James Conlon has kicked a few. Jack Flynn scored one point. But it kind of just sums them up. Uh, Mickey Newman is back for Mead today. It may not mean a lot to you, but Mickey Newman is, uh, had retired earlier uh, last year due to, hip, due to hip injuries. But he had a successful surgery and he's back on the Mead panel. He's wearing number 15. I saw Shane McEntee, the Mead captain, and Don, Don Kilgan warming up at half time. We could well see them, but it's been all Mayo so far. Okay, very good, Tommy. Thanks for that. Half time at McHale Park, as Tommy was saying, all Mayo. Mayo 311, Mead 1 5 in the same group. West Mead and Down both 0 for 2 coming into this game. Uh, down 9 points, West Mead 3 points is the latest there again, half time in that game. Also, Division 2 South, we have uh, two games which have just gone half-time. So Clare obviously have started the uh, campaign so well with two wins. They're trailing Cork by a point, so it's Cork 12 points, Clare 1-8. That's on in Ennis. And then the other game is on in Leash, and it's Leash 4 points, Kildare 1-7. So a six-point lead for Kildare at the break. We're taking short ad break here ourselves, and then we're back with more from Tommy Conlon and Mick O'Keefe on the Sunday Papers. The Sunday Papers on Off The Ball. The Irish entertainment industry has been patiently waiting in the wings. And here on News Talk, we're putting live performances back centre stage. Okay, sounds good. Concerts, theatre, stand up. How has the industry coped over the last 18 months? Is COVID too tough of an act to follow? And when can we get back to being part of it all? The show must go on on News Talk. Follow the series on air and online at newstalk.com. Sean, what's that thing going round the garden? That is my, uh, our new Husqvarna auto mower. 
Automower? Yeah, it's a robotic lawnmower from Husqvarna. Cuts the grass automatically, has GPS tracking, and an app. Even works in the rain. Hmm. I just thought, why spend time cutting grass when I could spend it with the family? Great! You can put the dinner on, so... Ah, uh, no can do, love. I have to paint the man cave. Husqvarna Automower. Never mow again. Learn more at husqvarna.ie. Planning to redesign your office? The team at Hunt Office Interiors have you covered. We've been specializing in glass partitioning systems and office fit-outs for over 21 years. With a wide range of glass partitioning held in stock, including our fire-rated systems, we've a solution to suit any requirement. Our design team are here to help bring your vision to life. Email interiors at huntoffice.ie and arrange to visit one of our ultra-modern showrooms in Dublin, Limerick and Cork. Hunt Office Interiors, supporting our business community for over 21 years. Afternoons are easy with insuremyvan.ie Ireland's low cost van insurance specialist. Get your business back on the road with insuremyvan's best price guarantee. For super savings visit insuremyvan.ie City Financial Marketing Group Limited training as insuremyvan.ie is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. The doors are open again at the Kia dealers of Ireland. You can now drop in to see the entire Kia range, including our award-winning EVs and PHEVs, and discover our flexible finance offers. Take a test drive, and soon you could be driving away with the peace of mind that comes with our unique Kia 7-year warranty. Find your nearest Kia dealer on Kia.com. Kia. Movement that inspires. This is a finance offer. Terms and conditions apply. Here at EurocyclesEuroBaby.com, we hope you and your family are keeping safe. We wanted to let you know we are back and fully stocked. No annoying jingles this time, just plenty of bikes. Open seven days a week, our stores on the Long Mile Road and Airside Swords have everything you need, from commuter bikes to electric bikes, kids' bikes and more. We're also fully stocked for all things baby. Check out the range and shop online at EurocyclesEuroBaby.com. Introducing the Romeo's Chicken Mix Combo Box. Succulent boneless breast, tender chicken goujons, crispy chicken wings, delicious onion rings, plus our famous chips and a dip for just $9.99. The Romeo's Chicken Mix Combo Box. Order now on the app or romeos.ie. Romeo's, ready when you are. It's a busy time on farms, so watch out for tractors, trailers, and other farm machinery using the roads. Be patient. Slow down and only overtake farm machinery when it's safe to do so. If you're driving a tractor, you must hold a license. Make sure your vehicle is roadworthy, check your load regularly and drive at a safe speed. Be aware of traffic building up behind you and when possible, allow cars to pass safely. From the Road Safety Authority and the Irish Farmers Association. Mum lives alone and values her independence. I'm always worried about her as we don't live nearby. Since I discovered Isaac, the new discreet 24-7 monitoring service from my home care, which is backed by a full telehealth service, I have peace of mind that she's okay, while mum retains her independence. The whole family is kept informed about her well-being through circles of care, and if required, there is always an expert my home care caregiver on hand 24-7. Visit isaac.care forward slash news talk. The new Dunn Stores app puts better value at your fingertips. Scroll your way through this week's savings. Save 33% per kilogram on Dunn Stores' new season fresh Irish whole leg of lamb. And toast your savings with 20% off our top 50 wines. Download the app today and receive a one-time 10 off 30 welcome voucher. Dunn Stores, always better value. Terms, conditions and exclusions apply. Welcome voucher can be used on next grocery shop of 30 euro or more. Please drink responsibly. This year, we can't shake our buckets to fund Special Olympics, but like our athletes, we can't stop now. So show your support and donate what you can to our virtual collection day. All their lives, Special Olympics athletes have been told what they can't do. But the only thing they can't do is stop. So please visit can'tstopnow.ie or text sport to 50300 to donate six euro today. Thank you. Text cost six euro. Special Olympics will receive a minimum of five euro forty cent. Service provider like charity. Helpline zero seven six six eight zero five two seven eight. The Sunday papers on off the ball. Now you're very welcome back. So Tommy Collin of the Sunday Independent and Mick O'Keefe, CEO of Teneo Ireland, both with us. Gents, we might turn to GA because the good times are here. It would seem and lots <laughs> of uh, various 
columnists are picking up on the theme. So Christy O'Connor, I might just uh, initiate things with in the Sunday Times. I think Christy always brings great research to his pieces and he's got the numbers here to back up the sense we all have at the moment that the game is really opening up. So he starts things off by talking about that Donegal Monaghan game in Bally Buffet last Saturday and how Declan Bonner said it was a crazy game. Donegal, 12 points from 14 shots in the second half. They finished with 120, but it was still only enough to scramble a draw. Monaghan scored four goals. They could have had nine. And then he gives us some of the figures. So, for instance, uh, thus far, Ulster, which has had a long reputation for defensive football, prior to this weekend, the four Division One North sides produced an average of 38 points per game. After the opening two league rounds, the total points per game was 34.6, which hammers the previous record of uh, 2014. He talks then, he has a little graph about just uh, championship football, whatever about league football. So back in 2001 in the football championship, there was an average of 29.5 points per game. Uh, A high point was 2018. We had 37.5 points per game. 2019, 35.7 points per game. Dropped a touch last year but that was a winter championship and it was a knockout championship so not as many games and uh, Mick talks about different things um, mentions the I guess the GEA equivalent of Gagan pressing teams are pressing very high up now and so if you beat the press then suddenly there's space in behind Evan Comerford showed that against Kerry last week or if uh, the press isn't beaten and maybe you win the ball high up that leads to a quick score uh, Colin O'Rourke picks up that bat on in the Sunday Independent and maybe puts it more succinctly. He says, might be a bit premature to think that we're on the brink of a new era of open attacking football on the basis of some of the games last weekend. But there was a real emphasis on moving the ball forward at pace and players encouraged to show their skills. Yeah, uh, um, sorry, I'll, I'll take that one, Joe, if you want. Um, um Really interesting piece by Christy O'Connor, I thought. Um, Colin O'Rourke is good too. Brawley's good. I know Tommy has a has a different take on this, more Dublin Kerry-focused piece. But um, for people who are football nerds like myself, um, it's great. And I, I'm not sure kind of average points per game is the best stat to kind of measure because sometimes, um, you know, that can denote one side of competitions, one side of competition as well. I think what we're seeing now in a wider sense is a higher quality uh, games, better score taking and there's a whole myriad of reasons, it's only when you piece all them together and I think Christy O'Connor is spot on, I think teams are pressing I think some of them have, have perfected the art of counter attack I think it all points to an evolution and I think this year what we're getting as well is players look fit, they look fresh, the pitches look you know, are, are playing well and they're playing quickly as well which I think which I think helps. And I think there's been an evolution of GA tactics away from the very dogged stop the other team playing mm-hmm. and more about how you set yourself up to score because I think people have moved away from we'll just keep this, you know, team to 10, 12 points and we'll try, you know, and and, and, and come out a point the other side. Um and I think it's fascinating and, and, and I think he, he makes some really good points. One thing I would slightly disagree with him on mm. is he talks about the black card been introduced in 2014. And I actually think with all the hullabaloo, particularly in hurling circles around rule changes, I actually think the GA uh, took the issue of the product that, that was football, um, you know, for 10 years, which I think people were really struggling with as a, as a, as a spectacle. Um, and they introduced things like tweaks to the kick out, um, the black card. I, I'm not totally opposed to the, to, the, to the mark rule either, I have to say. So I think we need to give the GA a little bit of credit here that they did actually facilitate new rules that enabled more skillful players um, to more freedom, which in turn, I think, enables teams to go out and play with a little bit more freedom. And maybe it's taken six, seven, eight years for that evolution to to come to fruition. And hopefully what we're going to see is high scoring, um, a lot more kick passing um, and and teams, as as I think um, Christy O'Connor alludes to, um, playing much further up the pitch um, because you, you can't win. And you see the club level all over the place. You can't win with a load of lads behind the ball. It's just a really difficult thing to execute. And players don't like it. Mm. Is the other thing. You talk to any player, he doesn't dream of waking up and you know, dropping back and playing on the 30 yards out from his own goal. The, the slightly different take on it and, um, um, is... Um, Brawley alludes to it and and as does Colm O'Rourke that it is about getting your better forwards into the right position and closer to the goal 
and having a system that actually means that Dean Rock and David Clifford and Con Callahan don't end up playing 50 yards out from goal. And we saw that with Gooch in the latter half of his career, where he ended up going so deep that he was almost ineffective at times. Now, he's a brilliant player, don't get, don't get me wrong. Sure. But I think what you're seeing is is the, the scoring forward staying in scoring positions and, and teams setting up in a way that suits the more skillful player and rules enabling more skillful play. Mm. Tommy, do you want to come in on all this? Yeah, I'm slightly, slightly puzzled about it, Joe, to some degree, because um, we're still seeing an awful lot of this dreadful lateral passing mm. and passing mm. over and back across the middle third of a field with maybe 13 opponents still behind the ball. Now, I admit, I don't know quite know how to uh, reconcile that with uh, the stats that Christie has outlined here. The, the, the data is there. The scores, uh, uh, the scoring average seems to be going up for the moment, anyway. And yet, at the same time, uh, we're looking at, we're still looking at this. I find really exasperating trend, and it's been going on for years. The uh, the way the game evolved from a kicking game to a hand passing game, almost like a basketball game, and and I, I recall Martin Brahney doing stats about that in recent years too, about the escalation, the sheer uh, um, doubling and trebling of hand passes. And uh, that's no, that's a pretty, that's no skill at all. Mm. And uh, and I find a lot of it still very turgid to watch. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, as Mick was saying and Christy is saying, this, the, the scores, the, the scoring averages are going up. So uh, riddle me that. I don't really, I don't have an explanation explanation as to why I, I like Mick's point there that um that players find would if players probably find it soul destroying if all they're told to do is get a, stay behind the ball and that's your job I mean may, maybe there's maybe maybe the players uh, just won't accept that anymore it's just too grueling and too joyless uh, what, what there, there are uh, as Mick says a myriad of reasons and Christy d- d- digs down into them here as well but uh, there's a part of me still wondering how it's happening because uh, we're still seeing a lot of the time 12 13 players behind the ball mm. I think though I, I think there's a part of this though Tommy that you know they'd be lauded Chelsea you know for their tactics and their the way they yeah. the way they set themselves up and you can laud soccer teams um and rugby teams for control and you know i i just wonder because we're ga purists like people don't like to see gaelic football teams taking a sting out of a game controlling game because it tends to go against the, what it was the traditional view of what ga should be and i'm not saying that's what you're saying i'm just saying that's some of the commentary that comes back right Mm. I watched Dublin and Kerry last week, and there were patches in the game where Dublin went over and back and over and back and over and back yeah. when, they were, when they were beating Kerry. And it's not great to look at, but they're actually completely controlling the game. And they're waiting for Kerry to come out of them, and, and they're, they're being patient. And all those things that we would say would be brilliant from a basketball team or a rugby team or a soccer team, because I think we want to see the ball being kicked and the ball move forward at pace, which is what looks better sometimes. Um, I, I, I I just think it's changed. I, I, I just think that a team can't be entitled to go over and back, over and back, if it's with purpose. I think what, what frustrates me is you see two teams and they park, they both park the bus and they both take 40 passes to get to the halfway line and then they fumble the ball and they turn it over and the other team has a go at the same thing. Right? And what's most frustrating is a team is losing by five points and they still have 13 men behind the ball mm. and they haven't got to a point where maybe we actually need to press. Um, and I, I think the better teams like Dublin and Kerry, you, you look at them in evolution, and Tyrone, you're looking at them in evolution as well, can play multiple different ways in multiple different times of the game. So Dublin will go hell for leather, toe-to-toe, and express themselves and go at a team. But then they will also have times in the game where Dublin will look super defensive, and yeah. they will also control a game, and they'll knock the ball around the halfway line until such a time as it suits them, um, or as such a time as the team has to come out, and then they try and play around them. So... Sorry, it's just only a small point. I, I no, do I, think I, I think that I think that's exactly the the key point. It's the pale imitations that actually give the tactics a bad name. Like Donegal 2012 were a thrilling team, but look at all the pale knockoffs of Donegal who didn't have the attacking prowess to go with the brilliant defence, and it looks so turgid. And here we are now, and 
uh, you sort of referenced it there, Mick. I mean, when Dublin take the sting out of a game, there's such a method to it and there's such an intelligence to it. And you know they're going to keep the ball and then work a really good score around the D, so you kind of forgive it. Whereas when lesser teams do it, I think half the time they're just going to cross the pitch back and forth with no real end point in sight. And that's where it can just become ridiculous. You do think yeah. that's bad, Joe? I watched the Division 5 team in Dublin there a few years ago and all they did is go over and back across the pitch. Yeah. for about 20 minutes <laughs> yeah. and, and, and like they, 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 they think Taylor yeah, they, I'm sure and they think they're playing ticky tacky GEA but yeah. actually they're just going around in circles it's um, it's, it's and, and there's another irony here and Mick, Mick uh, referred to it there uh, 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 via, via the Chelsea uh, example last night was that actually that um condensed very compressed uh, 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 configuration that they had actually turned out to be very creative as well. It became not, not just a, a method of closing down Man City, but it, it actually was a springboard for their own attacks. Yes. And they actually generated an awful lot of attacks last night and goal chances for out of that system. And we see Dublin in particular doing it uh, also. So there is a, there is th that is another apparent sort of paradox to it too, that out of that sort of... Um, uh, what seems cons conservative formations and that uh, it, 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 they actually can be productive in attack as well. So basically, I really don't know what <laughs> I really I really don't know how to, what way to come down on it. Except it's very interesting to see uh, Gaelic football evolve. All all sports should evolve. It's mm. a it's a healthy sign if they are uh, that there are people thinking about how to play their sport. And as mixes Gaelic football is no different to anyone to any other. Correct. One. The the one strange thing, Mick. The one the, 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 yeah, I was just going to say, the, the one strange thing is that, like, I don't know why in Gaelic games so many of the teams all have to do the same thing. You know what I mean? It's yeah. very, very homogenised. Yeah. Like, what, what, what are all 32 of us doing this year? As, like, you look at Chelsea and Man City last night. What, like, styles make fights and all that. We probably don't have that many styles in GEA is the only thing. We're all looking over the garden fence. Mm. Oh, we'll do that too. I know it's very yeah. slavish like and you know a yeah, team wins a championship and, and the next year they're all setting up the same way you know and someone had a psychologist we need a psychologist someone trained yeah. at six in the morning so we all need to train at six in the morning <laughs> yeah. you know and and I think there was a bit of that and I think look maybe Dublin because they seem to have got that balance right people are looking at Dublin and, and, and they do tend to look at the best teams and say okay well look how do we you know mirror that because you're, you're not going to beat the better teams with just one tactic. And I think what, what is happening in GEA and Gaelic football um, is that the teams are, are trying to understand that you you have to play three or four different ways in a game in order to win the game. And there's nothing wrong setting yourself up defensively for a certain period of time yeah. If, if, yeah. if that's the right thing to do with that. But you're not going to win a game doing it for the whole match. No. Fellas, got to take a short ad break. Back with more from Tommy Conlon and Mick O'Keefe in just a sec. The Sunday Papers on Off The Ball. At Permanent TSB, we know your first home isn't always your forever home. Times change, families grow, and now you're looking for something a little more permanent. We're helping you make that move with new lower rates for second-time buyers, meaning you'll see real savings every single month. That's permanent support. Book an appointment today at permanenttsb.ie. Lending criteria terms and conditions apply. Security and insurance is required. Warning, if you do not keep up your repayments, you may lose your home. Warning, if you do not meet the repayments on your loan, your account will go into arrears. This may affect your credit rating, which may limit your ability to access credit in the future. Permanent TSP PLC is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Now, that bit of stretch in the evening has this lot in great humour. Mind you, they're already delighted with themselves, saving a load by switching the car insurance to the AA. Still, it's nice to see them smiling. Because it'll be gone when they see what I did with their dinner. For a great deal in car insurance, call the AA. Monday to Friday, 9am to 5pm on 01674-0443. Who's got clever car insurance? Terms and conditions apply. Minimum premium of €280 Euro applies. AA Ireland Limited Trading as AA Insurance is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Some energy suppliers are just take, take, take. First they take your fancy with a one-time discount. Then take you for granted once your contract's up before taking you to the cleaners with massive bills. Don't take that. Take the power back with Pinergy Lifestyle. When you get your smart meter, simply choose from a range of sustainable energy plans to suit you and take control with an app that shows you exactly how your energy is used. Take the power back. Visit Pinergy.ie. You know what? Whoever said that nothing in life is free is wrong. My mate 
One leg Larry got a free ticket to a crocodile enclosure last year. Although, up until that point, we just call him Larry. It's probably a bad example, but what about your PRSI entitlement at Specsavers? That gives you a free eye test and free glasses from their 69 euro range. And now, get free hearing aids with PRSI too. Book an appointment or find out more at specsavers.ie. It's been a long year, but at last it's here. The massive Easy Living Interiors Summer Sale. We've reopened our doors with new styles in all stores and savings that are off the scale. Gorgeous sofas and chairs, tables, beds and homewares, designs that are stylish and clever. We can't wait to show you round and the bargains to be found in the best Easy Living Summer Sale ever. Easy Living Interiors, Cork, Waterford, Navan, Nace, Sandyford, Drogheda and Wexford. Sale now on. At Woody's, we know longer days mean getting the garden summer ready. That's why we've got great value on everything from plants to patio sets, along with tasty deals on barbecues too. Because it's more than a garden. It's making the most of summer. Now for less. Woody's. We're all homemakers. Sinead, you look a bit stressed. Is everything okay? No. I've shopping, prepping, cooking, and all the ironing to get sorted for next week. You're mad. Why don't you just use Gourmet Fuel? They've over 200 delicious calorie-controlled meals to choose from and deliver nationwide. You'll save time and feel great. Take the hassle out of healthy eating and order today at GourmetFuel.com. Ironing not included. Guaranteed Irish has been around for almost 50 years and has always been about doing the right thing. Today, business members work hard to support jobs, keep our communities alive and help the Irish economy recover. Guaranteed Irish supports 1,500 businesses from indigenous SMEs to locally based multinationals across various sectors, employing over 100,000 people across Ireland. So, look out for the G and know you're playing your part in Ireland's recovery. GuaranteedIrish.ie, all together better. What's most impressive about the all-new, totally redesigned Dacia Sendero? Is it its generous boot space or stylish LED headlights? Its smart media connectivity or comfort designed with you in mind? We think it's all of these things and still shockingly affordable from €39 Euros a week on the road. The all-new Dacia Sendero, the most affordable new car in Ireland, giving you more for less. Find out more at Dacia.ie today. Offer is made under a higher purchase agreement. Deposit required. Payments drawn monthly. Subject to lending criteria. Terms and conditions apply. See Dacia.ie. Across Ireland. Across Ireland. This is the Imro Radio Awards National Station of the Year. This, this is News Talk. It's three o'clock. Good afternoon, I'm Ross Lynch. Four people have been arrested in connection with a large gathering in Dublin city centre. Officers picked up the suspects in connection with public order offences on South William Street last night. The chief medical officer tweeted to say he was absolutely shocked by the scenes which were widely shared on social media. Kingston Mills is a professor of immunology at Trinity College. The numbers of cases that we're seeing every day is still relatively high at four to five hundred. And inevitably when restrictions are eased and people come in contact more, th those numbers are going to go, go up again and that's, that's worrying. Health officials have confirmed 374 new cases of COVID-19. 99 patients with the virus are currently being treated in hospital. 35 of those are in intensive care. The European Affairs Minister says the introduction of the digital green cert for travel should reduce the chances of large delays at airports. Ministers have been warned passengers at Dublin Airport could face 10-hour delays due to COVID safety checks over the summer. Minister Thomas Burns says the cert will simplify travel compared to how things are right now. People are showing a piece of paper or maybe an email. There I see massive scope for delay, at least with the digital COVID cert when that comes through. There's a standardised way of looking at these things and it's a very simple extra check. Eye experts say increased demand for tests is a result of remote working. The Association of Optimists for Optometrists says that more screen time is leading to blurred vision, headaches and eye strain. Linda McGivney-Nolan speaks for the group. So taking regular breaks from the screen, getting up, stretching, moving around. And if you're trying to do that about every 20 minutes, then train your eyes to blink more. It's a good idea to try and set your workstation up in a, a, a position where you've got a good source of daylight. Finally, today could be the hottest day of the year so 
so far in parts of the country with temperatures set to reach 22 degrees Celsius. Alan O'Reilly from Carlo Weather says people should be prepared for the high temperature. There's a small chance of a shower kicking off mainly in the west and the north but lots of sunshine so don't forget the sunscreen. Seen a lot of red looking faces last night. And that's your news at two minutes past three. News Talk Weather. Thanks to Ryanair. The forecast today is low fares, on time flights, and improving customer service. Sunny spells over the coming hours with a few showers in the northern half of the country. Highest temperatures of 18 to 22 degrees, coolest along the coast. And now you're up to date on News Talk. The Sunday Papers on Off the Ball. You're very welcome back. Joe Malloy with you on the uh, Sunday papers. We have Tommy Conlon from the Sunday Independent, Mick O'Keefe, CEO of Teneo Ireland with us as well. Naomi Osaka playing in the French Open. She's on a whole host of uh, places. The Sunday Business Post have a big profile of Osaka, which I'll hold up there on page 23 of the Sunday Business Post. David Walsh is writing about Naomi Osaka on the back page of the Sunday Times. Paul Kimmage inside the Sunday Independent. Uh, in effect, uh, the point is, I think everybody's fairly familiar with Naomi Osaka at this stage. 23 years of age, she is the highest paid female athlete in history, made $50 million last year off the court, made $5 million on the court, has won four Grand Slams in no time. Very outspoken on a whole host of things, increasingly uh, social justice issues, as she, at a US Open last year, wore seven different face masks each bearing the name of a black victim of racial violence while playing her opponents. She forfeited a game as well following the shooting of Jacob Blake when he was shot seven times in the back by a policeman in Wisconsin. Osaka said she would forfeit her match to draw attention to police violence against black people. She uh, flew in and took part in the George uh, Floyd demonstrations as well last summer and she made headlines this week by saying she would not be partaking in any press conferences at the French Open. The Business Post here piece says, uh, quotes are saying, I've often felt that people, she's talking about the press here, have no regard for athletes' mental health and this rings a very true whenever I see a press conference or partake in one. We're often sat there and asked questions that bring doubt into our minds and I'm just not going to subject myself to that and I'm not going to subject myself to people that <laughs> doubt me and she's told the tournament organisers to fine her for not partaking in, in required press conferences and that they donate the money to charity I think she can be fined up to $20,000 per missed press conference so potentially a huge sum of money now I'm told I didn't see it she did an on-court interview after her first round match at the French Open but uh, it's uh, caught the attention of various people David Walsh and Paul Kimmage and they're uh, giving their views on it Tommy what's your take on the whole situation I don't have a take Joe because I'm just um, um, sort of processing the the information about it and uh, I'm a bit conflicted uh, about it really uh, and so I don't I haven't yes come down on one side or another and may not at all yeah. uh, uh, depending on what we find out um uh, is it is it for example specific to naomi asaka herself her own emotional or mental well-being yeah. and <clears throat> i might just on that uh, phrase uh, it's, it's been one of the i think um liberating um uh, uh, aspects of modern sport is that more, more and more sports people, uh, elite famous people have come out to talk about their battles with uh, mental health, be it uh, be it domestically in Ireland or internationally and um, and uh, that has been very admirable and uh, uh, I would have ho thought and hoped uh, helpful to a lot of uh, anonymous people who have been struggling with the same things on the other hand, I just wonder, are we going to reach a stage where the phrase mental health becomes just a catch-all, a cliche, and, and, and that people somehow just end up becoming sort of, uh, uh, sort of, it doesn't have the effect anymore on them. It, it, it just becomes another uh, meme, almost. And, uh, and it, 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 is there a danger of it when it's invoked, if, if it is going to be invoked so often or a lot of the time, will people just 
kind of become sort of antagonistic to it. Uh, that's a more general point. I, mm. I would have thought maybe to be careful about how often we bandy it around and maybe use it. Sorry, Joe, go ahead. No, I think that's yeah. a, I think that's a very kind of interesting broad point to make. Like, I, I'm not familiar enough with Naomi Osaka as a person. I haven't watched like dozens yeah, of either. press conferences. I haven't watched dozens of tennis press conferences like it's still kind of a niche sport except for about uh, four fortnights when the Grand Slams are on so I don't know like are they being harangued the whole time and is the tone of the press conferences particularly uh, vicious or difficult I mean David Walsh makes the point at the end of mm -hmm. his piece he says before anyone makes up their mind on this issue it's worth watching the video of Osaka's interview after her first round loss at Wimbledon two years ago the questions were reasonable and sensitively framed, but still her anguish meant she was in no fit emotional state to respond. I feel like I'm about to cry, she said before exiting. Her decision comes from a desire to protect herself. Um, yeah. And so like, yeah. you, can't, you can't have any quibbles with someone mm. who cites their mental health and they want to protect themselves. Um, I, I, I mean, that'd be the starting point. Absolutely n no problem with that at all I guess Mick and it's a bad look well, if the French yeah. Open want to fine her $20,000 when she is citing mental health I would think yeah I, I, there's, a, there's a few things in this right so the first yeah. one is obviously look if, if, if the girl has is feeling the stress of, of post game um, post match interviews well then she should be accommodated in some way shape or form if possible right mm. and I'm not aware of, of any underlying issues or, or anything like that either so um, it does seem a bit strange. Like I've seen some of these tennis press conferences. They aren't, you know, we're not talking about bear pit, how's the common stuff here? You know, it's how did you get on and, you know, what did you think? Um, Paul, I do think Paul, there is Paul Kimmage makes that point at length. Yeah, yeah. And, and I look, I, I do think there's a, a broad, look, there's a few things here. There's a broader piece around expecting young athletes to go straight from the emotion and, and stress of a, of a game in front of millions of people and go straight into a media environment, right? And we even expect amateur GA players with no training and no anything to go and do a pitch side after matches in front of thousands of people, right? Mm -hmm. So look, you're a professional, Joe, and you know, like th these things aren't easy for some people, right? So maybe we need to reframe this in a way as well to make them maybe um, and not expect that people can just do these things. However, she's been in the spotlight for a long time. Um, I think her, you know, she's making something like 55 million a year of which 50 is endorsements and fair play to her. And, you know, uh, just from, from seeing it from a certain perspective, you know, she takes all the boxes you know from a marketing and commercial perspective you know we have this situation now where you know there's not one major organization in the world that won't that won't that will go into a sponsorship unless there's a balance either a gender balance or a or a racial balance in that portfolio and that's great to see um and she is a a a, a black female um and she is getting you know i suppose the, the i want to use the benefit of that but obviously people want to be associated with her um, on, on, on the one hand but I think it probably does bring an added stress because she then is the poster girl for loads and loads of other stuff and whether she brought some of these upon herself and I don't mean that in a bad way but if she has been quite vocal on certain issues um, well then she's probably going to get a, a larger amount of scrutiny than others may get um, I think the point that David Walsh makes is absolutely bang on in that I don't I, all I think she's doing here is putting more um, stress on herself um, by flagging this and not doing um, media of which he's contracted to do um, and again look if there's other things at play well then that, that obviously that needs to be factored in but like in in sport you know are we are we better off or worse off for her media blackout you know you'd have to say that we're worse off for she has interesting things to say she's one of the poster girls of her sport you know, I, I think I, I don't think it's a good decision um, un, unless there are other underlying um, reasons why she can't or just just can't cope in those kind of environments. Um, and I'd like to see her hopefully reverse that decision and and, and maybe and maybe do those interviews um, post game because people do want to hear from her. Um, and, you know, what, what you don't want is I don't think people, unfortunately, it becomes part of the gig and you can't really cherry pick all the bits that you like and maybe all some of the bits that you don't like um and even if that is media engagement because we're all part of the wider ecosystem of sport news talk is the irish independent everybody is part of the wider ecosystem and they all feed off each other and without media um there is no sport either right <laughs> um and it needs it, it's the conduit to which the masses still get their information and it's still and, and where they hear from 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 these high profile athletes so um i would like to see her reconsider that and maybe um maybe engage with with media post 
um, post match in those press conferences. That, that's just my yeah. view on it, Joe. Paul, the headline in Paul Kimmage's piece is an actual living hero is 10 times as likely to walk down your street than to appear on TV. And so he, well, it's kind of an, an interesting way of going about it. He imagines a conversation with Naomi Osaka about the situation. And in this conversation, he says to her, I've watched clips of uh, athletes. Um, uh, this is no, uh, sorry. He says you have played in five tournaments this year, and he names the tournaments. And in this imagined conversation, she says, "Yeah." He says that's twenty-one press conferences and three hundred and seventy-two questions. So then Paul Kimmer says, "I've gone through them one by one." <laughs> uh, here's a flavour. Are you a player that thrives off the energy of fans? How are you grappling with being seen as the face of women's tennis these days? What have you learned about being a businesswoman over the past few months? What's it like being back in Melbourne? What's the best live match you've ever been to? Goes on to other uh, questions. You're one of the poster athletes for the Olympic Games. Was it disappointing to hear the comments uh, from Yoshiro Mori about women? Uh, do you drink or try wine? How important is the world number one ranking to you? What has been your worst tennis related dream? And then a final few. Do you have a lot of input into the designs that you wear for Nike? Do you consider yourself to be a brand? Have you been watching the George Floyd trial? You've launched your skincare company, uh, et cetera. Maybe I'm laboring the point here. How are you able to be so successful on both the court and as a businesswoman, et cetera? Congratulations on your Laureus Award. What was your reaction when you got the news? You're one of the new faces at Louis Vuitton. Are you going to come out with a collab soon etc and his conclusion is it's not exactly the Spanish Inquisition is it and on the basis of those questions it's not um, so like in general terms because you can't talk about an individual like Osaka because we don't know her we don't know what's going on behind the scenes and if she's saying that look it's my, for my mental health then you have to just take that at face value in general terms the questions don't look to be that horrific so I guess the worry is Ultimately, if, uh, you know, this is a, a line in the sand and all a lot of the tennis players, Tommy can just say, well, look, frankly, you know, I, in so much as I take Mick's point about how um, everything's all connected and the media need the stars and the stars need the media. We're probably at a point now where Naomi Osaka's social media following completely dwarfs the following of any media organisations she's talking to. And a lot of the stars now can say I, I actually don't need the media I can talk to them directly yeah. I can do it on my terms I can do it without the questions like she might turn around and say I find these questions inane that I'm being asked I mean it's not that they're all uh, horrifically upsetting to me it's just I find the whole process draining I want to prioritise my performance I will talk to fans on my terms through my social media I'll give them the insights I want to give them I'm not a I'm not I'm not a, a in office here I don't owe you anything I don't owe you explanations to anything once I'm abiding by the rules and doing my thing so frankly I'm out and find me if you want to find me and do something nice with the money um, mm. I, you know increasingly that could become the default position for a lot of the top players Phil Mickelson sort of did it last week actually interestingly at um, yeah. Keogh a, a man who's very open with the media plays the game very well by all accounts, we were hearing the various broadcasters saying Phil was letting it be known through his management that it was three questions, three questions only. He's in, he's out. He ain't, he ain't sitting here talking to you guys for half an hour because he wanted to focus on his performance. And he was vindicated. And if Naomi Osaka wins the French Open in two weeks' time, not really spending time in a press conference asking inane or insensitive questions then I think she will feel absolutely vindicated and she'll say that's just the, that's the way the world now media deal with it yeah but that's well, what's the you know what's the, what's the point of it of, the, of of independent media then you know like like do we get to this point where you know everything is either sponsor driven content you know we've these brands who are now publishing their own content we've in, in short in, in content, short so. in short make we do and it's not as good that is that is where we get to and it won't yeah, be as good. Uh, yeah, and, and it, it's it, like it's not it's not as good. And you, you need people there to ask questions. And you know, okay, it doesn't have to be an us and them thing. You know, um, like if we get to a point where people are only going to talk to their own social channels or through their sponsor channels, well, then we're going to end up in an overly controlled world of blandness, which I don't think anybody wants either. Now, she's not there to be grilled and turned over every time she goes into a press conference. But you know, media are, are there to ask questions and they're there to ask questions on behalf of the fans and others. Um, and otherwise, we're going to end up, you know, with this, as I said, just this completely controlled, um, bland, vanilla content coming at us the whole time, where famously we've had people going out doing, you know, my first interview would be with, you know, X Association TV, you know what I mean? Yeah. Of course you never, yeah. you're not going to get asked any questions. You know, like it's, 
you know, and 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 are they going to just hide behind, um, you know, just pushing stuff out? That becomes a broadcast. It doesn't become an an, an interview. Um, I wouldn't like to see it go down that road. And look, these um, global partners and and broadcast partners and um, and and fans want to hear from from these people. So you know, I'm sure it's the last thing the world fellas want to do. And athletes want to do is is sometimes go into a press conference, particularly after losing, um, and to have to front up. But you know that to me, I kind of would think is 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 part of your job. Do you want to come in, Tommy? Final word on yeah. all this. Yeah, I mean, um, and it's it's actually quite a complicated issue when you start drilling down into it. And mm. uh, both David and Paul uh, actually do two very very good pieces, I think, in very different ways. And um, in Paul's piece, he 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 actually it's just a kind of a creative way of, uh, and um, he just has kind of a, a, an imaginative take whereby he begins by quoting Gene Collier, a former sports writer with the Pittsburgh Post Gazette, and um, in which Collier apparently had a realization m- many years ago waiting outside the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, locker room waiting for quotes and. Uh, uh, and decided to jack it in, and and editorially, uh, I, I, uh, Gene Collier made this point, and Paul makes it, and David makes it. Editorially, an awful lot of the uh, post-game interviews across all sports are editorially almost worthless. They are incredibly useless. Mm. These these uh, these absolutely sycophantic, deferential, marshmallow questions. Uh, uh, sort of, inf- uh, sort of, it, it's infantilizing of both. I think the athlete and the uh, interviewer. And isn't the and, isn't isn't the implicit understanding there though that if you don't ask questions along yes. those lines, then I'm not going to give you access yes. in future. That's the unwritten situation Correct. here with these kind of lick ass interviews all the time, post Correct. post post round or post match. And it's the ancient, it's that ancient, and it's, it predates uh, Osaka and it goes back 100 years. It's the ancient battle between access and... Um, Proper questions. Uh, correct. Access and editorial. Yeah. The, uh, you, you, listen, Joe, you know the story too. You've, you've, oh, 100%. Yeah. But we're, we're yeah. now... Yeah, but it's it, the, the, the great change now, though, the great change now is they no longer need the media at all. Agreed. That the is the difference. Of, the power. Well, uh, look at our, our power has been ebbing away anyway. The power of the traditional media, let's call it print, and and e- indeed even intelligent, has been ebbing away through technology and the internet anyway. And this, in a way, is just another manifestation of the tilting of the balance away towards the, the sort of institutional authority, for example, that the print media used to have. It's ebbing away, and I, I have personally happened to think that the the one way we can retain our credibility and authority and relevance is be, by being as editorially as uh, tough and interesting and entertaining and independent and um, and taking our work as seriously as we can all the time and maybe saying what the whole rest of corporate sport will uh, will refuse to say mm. and and I that's maybe me clutching at straws but I, st- I i do think it's as urgent as ever that we do we do our work well and with uh, uh, with integrity and with the sort of creativity and i think uh skill that david and paul have shown in their pieces today mm. you were trying to get in there mick no sorry no I, like I, I i agree look I, I wouldn't underestimate um how important the, the, the media remains right because you know it, it it still is vital that that um you know the best interviews you read now are still interviews that are done you know w- you know it, it, they're not necessarily pushed out content you know that's overly controlled um i would argue in the case of osaka as well there's probably european based tennis journalists sports writers who would never get an opportunity to sit in the same room and talk to this lady right and surely part of the whole um i suppose joy you've been a sports writer um uh, uh, even if the access is sitting down in a room and you're one of 25 or 50 people yeah. um surely that that should remain um something that journalists get that even if it's controlled access post match or post game um surely that should still remain part of the gig and i i, I do appreciate that a lot of the post uh, match interviews are bland and they tend to be can, can i tell us how great you were today um but in saying that, 
Um, sometimes they're not. Um, and sometimes you do glean an interesting insight from somebody who maybe gives something away in terms of how they were playing in X set or mm. how they've struggled with some, an, an injury the week leading up or something that, that could be quite interesting, that could colour the, the post-match analysis or post-game analysis. And I would think it's a shame that I hope it's not a, a, another trend that people are just going to give the two fingers to 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 um, post post game press conferences and just not turn up. Like it's hard in the GA where the fellas aren't been paid to do it. I right? know. Yeah. Like, this is professional sport where people are been paid, um, and it is and it is part of the gig. And again, caveating all this in terms of of maybe um, after intense scrutiny over the last number of years, he's just feeling enormous strain um, and is quite anxious about these things. Mm. Well, then surely there could, something could be done for her that isn't quite the nuclear option, just not turning up at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, look, in her instance, when she's citing mental health, it's absolutely yeah. no problem. I think we're all emphasising that point. I guess the interesting thing is if it becomes a wider trend and, yeah. you know, um, yeah. it just becomes Watch a thing. Well, space, I do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it'd be, in, it'd be interesting to see. So that's Naomi Saka, who's won her first round, actually, and uh, is playing at the French Open. We're talking to Luke Jensen later on about the French Open on the show. Clock's massively coming against us. We're not going to get to... We had wanted to touch on... There's a there's an interesting interview with Jamie McGraw, who's been called up to the Irish squad. There's a farce, our future, the Logan Paul versus Floyd Mayweather fight, which is on next Sunday. There's Eamon Sweeney on Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. Tommy, you saw a great piece on... Cuban baseball, there's the FAI at 100 years. We had jotted down all these pieces to get to and we've, uh, well, I've made a mess of things by not getting us there quickly enough. Um, any of those in particular you would like to mention, Tommy? Um, Mark Gallagher has, in, has a good update on, on the Tokyo Olympics yes. and the uh, massive tensions yeah, that are unfolding over there uh, and indeed the International the international Olympic Committee demanding their pound of flesh off the city of Tokyo, of the athletes and all like that. That's worth checking out to keep up to date with. The baseball one, very briefly, Joe, it's in the uh, uh, foreign news section, world news section of the Sunday Telegraph, not the sports section, about a, a brilliant Cuban baseball player who has defected to the United States and the ramifications for that even geopolitically between Joe Biden and uh, and the American uh, political machine and the Cuban uh, Americans in Florida and, and the Cuban government and all like that. That's just something out of left field that I found very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, Joe, I'll only go to Solskjaer in the back of the Indos quote article. I, Philip Quinn, 100 years at the FAI, is yeah. really interesting for people who are into that kind of stuff. Um, I know news talk this morning, there was a guy on Donald Fallon, I think, talking about T Talca Park. It was a brilliant piece, actually. Um, and people who are interested in Irish football are interested in the history of, of Irish um, sport. That 100 year journey, um, I think what you find when you get to, the, get, get to it, a couple of things. One is, um, how Irish soccer just mirrors what was everything that was going on around it. So you had the 1920s and the split with Northern Ireland. Then you had the the Nazi issue when the you know the the Nazi flags flying um, and the Irish team did this Nazi salute in 1939. Mm. Um, all the way through. But the most you know thing that jumps out to me is that the most interesting things in Irish football have actually happened in the recent past. Um, Saipan, Jack Charlton, um, all that kind of good stuff. So. Um, but it's a very interesting read, and I think we're going to read more about it. And one thing I, I think with this, Joe, as well, the FAI are, are, are really bad at celebrating. Um, they have been traditionally bad at celebrating, um, you know, anniversaries. Only when the likes of Alan McLaughlin pass away and stuff like that, you really get a, get a sense that you look back. Um, the GEA and RFU are, are substantial, have been substantially better at those milestones and celebrations. Um, uh, and I think maybe it's time for the FAI to come out and and look at its 100 year history for good and for bad and, and celebrate the good times and, and hopefully look to a new era for Irish soccer as well. But I, I, I really enjoyed that that um, article um, as well, if, if people are, are interested in having a look at that. OK, very good. You're a Man United fan, Mick, are you? I am. And on Eamon Sweeney drowning out of his depth, uh, Manchester United will win nothing as long as Solskjaer is the manager. There'll be goals, entertainment, excitement, but there won't be trophies. Solskjaer's Manchester United aren't really Manchester United, they're Spurs. Let's face it, if they couldn't win Wednesday's Europa League final against Villarreal, what are they going to win? Are you a uh, stick with Oli? He's at the wheel and we love it. Or are you uh, in agreement with Eamon Sweeney there? No, so look, there's a couple of things. And actually, um, Roy Curtis touches on one thing in the in the Sunday World where he talks about, you know, would any other club Manchester United benchmarks itself against be chasing Oli Gunnar Solskjaer to be their manager, right? And look, I'm, I'm in the glass half-empty camp, unfortunately. I... I, I it pains Man United fans to criticise Solskjaer because he kind of was the the absolute uh, legend 
and everything selfless and all those things and, and is the one of the poster boys of that glorious generation um half glass full version is second in the league got to a european final some of the form of the likes of fernandez mctominay rashford etc the half empty version is we didn't make it to the champions league quarter we uh, champions league knockout stages I think the issues in Manchester United are deeper than Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, but that does that mean Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is up to the job? Um, I think if you're going to be benchmarking against the real heavyweights, and this is a conversation I was having with fellas watching the match last night, is, you know, he's no Tuchel, he's no Guardiola, he's no Klopp. They're heavyweights, in, you know, in, in managerial terms. Mm. Um, I, I, he's learning on the job. I, I think United could do better, but I think their problems probably run a bit deeper than who the manager is. Yeah. Fellas, we're out of time. Thanks so much it's for all of us. And so, sorry. Probably fair. Sorry, sorry, Tommy, say that again. Sorry, Joe. I said uh, it's a tough piece by uh, by Eamon Sweeney on Ollie Goner Solskjaer, but ultimately probably true. Yeah. yeah. In my opinion. Yeah. Tommy Conlon of the Sunday Independent, Mick O'Keefe, CEO of Teneo Ireland. Gents, thanks very much. Enjoy the bit of sunshine. Thanks, Joe. Cheers. Thank you. We will Paddling. take a uh, short break. I think you, Mick was about to say Paddling Bull is out. Um, good luck to him. We'll take a short break and then we'll fill you in on what's going on in all the GEA. We'll check in at McHale Park as well, where it's gone full-time. Mayo have beaten me 3.17 to 2.12. We're also going to be over to Chew, Michael Meehan, in waiting because Dublin are about to play Galway. The Sunday Papers on Off The Ball.